Spina bifida is a birth defect that occurs when the spinal cord fails to form properly, leaving a section of the spinal cord and spinal nerves exposed through an opening in the unborn baby's back. There are several scientific names for spina bifida. It is also known as myelomeningocele or meningomyelocele. Although there are many theories about why this happens, the exact cause of spina bifida is unknown. However, we do know that spina bifida occurs early in pregnancy during the development of the spinal cord, typically about 35 to 42 days since your last menstrual period, or LMP. This rare condition is reported to occur in one out of every 1,500 to 2,000 births in the United States every year. To better understand the problems associated with spina bifida, let's first review the normal development of the spinal cord. In early fetal life, the tissue that covers the spinal cord closes like a zipper. This typically begins in the middle of the spinal cord and closes in both directions, toward the head and toward the bottom of the unborn baby. This process starts at about 35 days into fetal life. At 36 days since your last menstrual period, there is almost complete closure of the spinal cord, with only small openings near the head and bottom. By 42 days since your last menstrual period, there should be complete closure of the spinal cord, also known as the neural tube. However, failure of the neural tube to completely close will result in a neural tube defect. If the tissue fails to close near the fetus's head, a condition known as anencephaly can occur. Failure of the tissue to close at the bottom end of the fetus results in a myelomeningocele or spina bifida. Here you can see the differences in development of a normal fetus in comparison to a fetus with an open neural tube defect at the bottom of the fetus, an example of spina bifida. Several variations of spina bifida can occur. These variations depend on how the neural tube defect continues to develop, on what is protruding through the open neural tube, and what is covering the spina bifida abnormality. These variations include spina bifida occulta, or hidden spina bifida. This is a covered neural tube defect where a layer of skin covers the opening in the spine. This form of spina bifida occurs in approximately 15% of patients and rarely causes any neurological problems. Myeloschisis is a flat neural tube defect without a layer of skin covering the opening of the spine. The spinal cord and the surrounding nerve tissue is exposed to the amniotic fluid. These forms of spina bifida have similar risks and symptoms as myelomeningoceles. Meningoceles contains only spinal fluid that sticks out through an outpouching or sac through an abnormal opening in the spine. This abnormality does not contain any nerve tissues. Babies with meningocele have few or no symptoms while others may develop degrees of paralysis with bladder and bowel dysfunction. Myelomeningocele is the most severe form of a neural tube defect. It contains both fluid and nerve tissue within a sac. This occurs when the spinal cord or neural elements are exposed through the opening in the spine, which results in nerve damage with partial or complete paralysis of the body below the level of the spinal opening. Individuals may be unable to walk and may have bladder and bowel dysfunction. Both meningoceles and myelomeningoceles may have a covering of skin with or without an outpouching, known as covered neural tube defect. These conditions typically have very mild to no symptoms. During the end of the second trimester, you can see the opening of the spinal cord and spina bifida defect developing. The image on the left is a view from the side. As you can see, there is an opening in the spinal cord that allows an outpouching of tissue. This is myelomeningocele. The image on the right demonstrates an outpouching from the defect as you look down on the fetus's back. The spinal column is divided into four sections. Each segment of the spinal cord corresponds with a specific region of sensory or sensation and motor or movement functions in the body. Starting from the head, there are seven cervical vertebrae found in the neck. Spinal nerves at this level supply movement and feeling to the arms, neck, and upper trunk of the body. Next are 12 thoracic vertebrae associated with the chest, followed by five lumbar vertebrae found in the lower back, 
and six sacral vertebrae that fuse at the bottom to form the tailbone or coccyx. In the normal spine and spinal cord, nerves leave the spinal cord and are numbered according to the vertebrae at which they exit the spinal column. Their function is linked to the level at which they leave the spinal cord. The location of spina bifida defect can result in abnormal function. A spina bifida defect is defined based on the level and extent of the bony opening along the spinal canal. The level of bony defect can help us predict the nerve damage that a child may experience. The level of the nerve damage may result in loss of sensation or problems with motor function including bowel, bladder, and sexual dysfunction. Since most spina bifida defects are associated with the lumbar spine, which is responsible for the nerve function in the legs and lower body, we will focus on consequences associated with these types of defects. In general, the nerves associated with L1 to S1 are associated with movement and sensation of the lower legs. Nerves associated with L1 to L3 are responsible for flexing the knee, whereas nerves associated with L4 to L5 allow the knee to extend. At the same time, all the nerves from L1 to L5 are required to provide nerve function to the thighs and hips. The motor function of the foot and ankle are controlled by the lower nerves. However, all of the nerves in the lumbar and sacral spine are needed to properly coordinate movement of the hips, legs, and feet in order to walk. Spinal levels L4 and L5 allow one to raise the foot. Spinal levels S1 and S2 allow one to lower the foot. In general, when the spina bifida involves a level above L3, the ability to walk normally is significantly impaired. In addition to the movement of the lower extremities, nerves in the lumbar and sacral regions help control functions of the internal organs. Since many cases of spina bifida involve the sacral nerves, children with spina bifida often have problems with urination and bowel control. In later life, sexual function may also be affected. Typically, children with bladder problems are unable to completely empty the bladder. Problems with bowel control may result in soiling. Patients with spina bifida may experience some sexual dysfunction, but this may not affect their reproductive ability. The exact mechanism by which the spina bifida defect causes nerve damage is unclear. There are several theories, but the most popular one is a two-hit approach. The first hit is the failure of the spinal column to properly close, resulting in the exposure of the spinal cord and its nerves, which may cause nerves to abnormally develop. This, by itself, may or may not directly cause nerve damage. However, a second hit occurs where the open nerve fibers are exposed to the amniotic fluid, which can be damaging, and nerves can also be directly damaged by trauma due to bumping and rubbing against the uterine wall. In addition to the spinal cord problems, patients with spina bifida can develop two distinct problems related to the brain, buildup of fluid within the spaces of the brain, called hydrocephalus, and a sinking of the lower part of the brain into the base of the skull, known as hindbrain herniation, or Chiari malformation. In the normal brain, the brain tissue contains and is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid, otherwise known as CSF. Normally, most of the CSF fluid is made by special tissue that lines the open spaces within the brain, called the ventricles. This fluid then flows around the back of the brain, in a region that contains the cerebellum and brainstem, and into the spinal canal to surround the spinal cord all the way to the tailbone. In the case of spina bifida, the defect at the bottom of the spine allows the CSF to leak out the opening of the spinal canal and pulls the brain downward into the base of the baby's skull, which is called Chiari II malformation. This blocks the normal flow of cerebrospinal fluid and causes the ventricles to enlarge, a secondary brain abnormality known as hydrocephalus. Traditionally, spina bifida is repaired shortly after the baby is born. If the defect is diagnosed during pregnancy, babies with spina bifida are typically delivered by C-section. Because the spinal cord defect does not directly affect the heart or lungs, babies are generally very stable and do not require any immediate treatment. Nonetheless, babies are transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit for close medication attention. At that point, 
Neonatologists and pediatric neurosurgeons work together to further evaluate the baby and identify any additional problems. They also prepare the infant for repair of the spina bifida. A pediatric neurosurgeon will perform the repair within the first few days of life, and depending on the severity of the hydrocephalus, infants may or may not require a tube that drains the excessive fluid from the brain at the same time. This tube is called a ventriculoperitoneal, or VP, shunt. Babies eventually recover and once stable are able to go home. Children with spina bifida are followed very closely by several pediatric specialists, including a pediatric neurosurgeon, pediatric neurologist, pediatric urologist, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and pediatricians who specialize in spina bifida. In most centers, including the fetal center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital, spina bifida children are enrolled in a comprehensive program to address their medical problems, monitor them for long-term problems, and provide support to families. Many of the complications of spina bifida will not show until later in life. As mentioned earlier, these may include problems with walking, bowel and bladder function, and neurological development. After the initial repair, future operations and therapy may be needed to treat the problems associated with spina bifida. For example, VP shunts are placed to treat hydrocephalus. The VP shunt drains the built-up fluid in the brain into the abdomen, where it can be absorbed. This treatment can be successful in managing many of the problems that can occur in children with spina bifida. Although VP shunts are effective in draining the fluid, they are mechanical devices and they sometimes fail due to blockage or movement and must be replaced. Shunts can also become infected and require removal. A baby with spina bifida will usually have several shunt revisions in his or her lifetime. These treatments address the problems associated with spina bifida but, unfortunately, cannot restore the nerve damage that has already occurred. Today, alternative options exist to treat children with spina bifida. After decades of research, surgery to repair the spina bifida defect before the baby is born, also known as fetal surgery, is a possibility for babies and mothers who qualify for the procedure. In early 2011, the New England Journal of Medicine published the results of the management of myelomeningocele study, or MOMS trial, that studied the effects of fetal surgery for the repair of spina bifida compared to the routine care of surgery after birth. This study was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and was conducted over eight years. The primary purpose of the study was to determine if there was a difference in infant death or need for a VP shunt between fetal surgery patients and those repaired after birth. During the eight-year period, more than 1,000 pregnant mothers whose fetuses were diagnosed with spina bifida were initially screened for the study. Due to a variety of factors following additional exams and evaluation, 183 patients were randomly placed into two groups, with 92 to the after-birth repair group and 91 in the fetal surgery repair group. Ultimately, the study was stopped early when the committee that was monitoring the results noted a clear benefit to infants that had undergone fetal surgery. The study results were made public in early February 2011. For patients to be eligible for the MOMS trial, they had to meet specific maternal and fetal requirements. The fetal requirements included, but were not limited to, a pregnancy of a single fetus. Pregnancies with twins were excluded since the twin without spina bifida would be put at higher risk for premature delivery after fetal surgery. The pregnancy had to be associated with a single fetus between 19 and 25 completed weeks of gestation, which was the time period for potential fetal surgery. To qualify for the mom study, the mother had to be more than 18 years of age, her body mass index, or BMI, had to be less than 35, which is a number calculated based on weight and height. A BMI greater than 35 is considered to indicate significant obesity and would increase the risk of prematurity. A history of a previous incision on the uterus, such as a classical C-section, puts the pregnant patient at risk for scar separation late in pregnancy, and therefore was excluded from the study. Because the risk of preterm delivery is higher in patients with fetal surgery, Mothers with any conditions or history that increase the risk of preterm delivery, such as short cervix, were also excluded from the trial. 
Additional risk factors that prevented a woman from being included in the study were insulin-dependent diabetes, infection with hepatitis B or C, HIV infection, red cell aloe immunization, and unwillingness to accept blood transfusions for various reasons. The unborn baby also had to meet certain criteria in order to enter the mom's trial. These included the presence of a myelomeningocele, beginning with the first thoracic vertebra, T1, and the first sacral vertebra, S1, levels. Chiari 2 malformation had to exist at the time of evaluation. There could be no evidence of an exaggerated curving of the spine. The spina bifida could not be associated with other major fetal anomalies, such as a heart defect. Finally, the fetus had to have normal chromosomes found by amniocentesis. Because of the research aspect of this study, patients were carefully chosen to maximize the benefits of fetal surgery while minimizing the risks to both mom and baby. There were two main outcomes of the study. The first was death or need for a VP shunt by one year of age. The designers of the trial felt that if the children did not receive a shunt by one year of age, they were not likely to need a shunt during their lifetime. The second main outcome of the study was to measure the mental and motor development using standardized tests at 30 months of age. In addition to the outcomes on the baby, one of the greatest contributions from the mom's trial was the information provided on the risks of fetal surgery for the pregnant mother. Some complications directly affected the mother, while others were effects of the pregnancy. 6% of women who underwent fetal surgery suffered from extra fluid on their lungs, known as pulmonary edema. This often requires oxygen support, but eventually corrects itself. Problems with the membrane sac that surrounds the fetus are a known complication with any fetal surgery, and this was certainly seen in the mom's trial. One in four patients was noted to have a separation of the membranes from the uterine wall after the surgery. Membrane separation is a risk factor which may lead to early delivery. Membrane separation occurred in almost half of the patients after fetal surgery and was six times more likely to occur than when the spina bifida repair was postponed until after the delivery of the baby. The risk for decreased amount of amniotic fluid around the fetus, also known as oligohydramnias, was twice as likely to occur in the fetal surgery group as a result of leakage of fluid through the surgical incision. Infection rates were slightly higher in the fetal surgery groups. Any fetal surgery is at risk for separation of the placenta from the uterus, also known as placental abruption. This can occur at any point during the surgery and afterward. Depending on the severity of the abruption, some fetuses may require emergent delivery. During the mom's trial, the obstetricians examined the uterine incision used for the fetal spina bifida repair earlier in pregnancy at the time of the C-section delivery. They found that the scar was very thin in one out of four cases and that there was evidence of uterine scar separation in an additional 10% of cases. Keep in mind, most of these complications are known problems with fetal surgery and would have only been expected in the fetal surgery group of patients. In normal pregnancies, some of these problems can occur but are rare. Fetal repair of spina bifida was also associated with significantly increased risks for the newborn. Most of the neonatal complications were related to the prematurity at birth. The average gestational age at delivery was about three weeks earlier in the fetal surgery group at 34.1 weeks versus 37.3 weeks. 13% of babies were delivered before 30 weeks gestation. An additional one-third were delivered between 30 and 34 weeks, and another one-third were delivered between 35 and 36 weeks. This means that only one in five babies that underwent fetal surgery were delivered at term. Because of the prematurity, birth weight, which corresponds with their gestational age at birth, was less in the fetal surgery group. The increased rate of prematurity in the fetal surgery group was also associated with a 21% incidence of respiratory distress syndrome, seen in preterm infants requiring oxygen and ventilator support in the babies. This was three times higher than the postnatal repair group. The benefits of fetal repair of spina bifida appear to be statistically superior to postnatal repair. The primary outcome of the study, which was death or need for a VP shunt in the first year of life, was 30% less frequent in the fetal surgery group than in the postnatal repair group.
The major differences in the two groups appeared to be related to the improvement of the Chiari 2 malformation in the fetal repair group. Babies who underwent fetal repair were half as likely to need a VP shunt at one year, 40% versus 82%. In addition, while all fetuses that were entered into the study had evidence of hindbrained herniation on MRI during their mother's pregnancy, it appeared that the Chiari 2 malformation was less common and less severe among babies that underwent fetal surgery as compared to postnatal repair. In fact, 36% of infants who underwent fetal surgery had no evidence of hindbrain herniation compared to only 4% in the postnatal surgery group. However, at 12 months, there was a higher percentage of infants needing operations for tethered cord syndrome a condition where the spinal cord becomes stuck to the surrounding tissue within the spinal canal, causing the spinal cord to become abnormally stretched as the child grows. This occurred more often in the fetal surgery group compared to the postnatal surgery. At 30 months of age, neurological outcomes were reviewed and mental development in both groups was similar. However, motor development scores seemed significantly better in the fetal surgery group. While the ability to walk depends on the level of the spina bifida lesion, the study found that twice as many children who underwent fetal surgery were walking independently as compared to the postnatal group, 42% in the fetal surgery group compared to only 21% in the postnatal repair group. Overall, the degree of disability in a child was lower among fetal surgery patients. The MOMS trial was a landmark study in the world of fetal therapy. Historically, fetal surgery was used only for life-threatening conditions in which the fetus would likely die during pregnancy if left untreated. However, the MOMS trial was the first study that demonstrated significant benefit in children who had undergone fetal surgery for spina bifida, a non-lethal disease. Careful analysis of the study results demonstrated the benefits outweighed the risks and harms of fetal surgery, including those associated with the mother. Although there are still unknown answers to many more questions, especially those about long-term outcomes, it appears that babies who underwent fetal surgery have benefited in the short term. Unfortunately, the MOMS trial provides only statistics and not specifics about your baby, which is what all parents want to know. For many families, this comprehensive multi-day evaluation and consultation is the first opportunity to meet healthcare professionals who specialize in this condition and ask questions and receive information specific to them. The extensive consultation process is designed to help patients learn about spina bifida and what life is like for a child with the condition. Families also learn about all of the treatment options so they have a full understanding of the risks and benefits of conventional treatment versus fetal surgery. When patients are referred to the fetal center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital, they undergo comprehensive evaluation and education consultations. This includes a multidisciplinary team approach, including specialists from both maternal fetal medicine and pediatric subspecialties. Before fetal surgery can be considered further, thorough counseling and evaluations are provided to ensure there are no unnecessary risks to the mother and that the baby is in an appropriate candidate for surgery. Early in the evaluation process, families meet a dedicated nurse coordinator from the fetal center who will guide them through a step-by-step -step process that includes the following. A maternal fetal medicine specialist will perform a complete maternal and pregnancy history evaluation and physical examination and will evaluate the fetal ultrasound to ensure there are no other complications. Families will meet with a spina bifida pediatric specialist who will provide valuable and unique information on what life is like for spina bifida children and their families. The pediatric neurosurgeons will educate families about spina bifida and the surgical treatments involved with fetal surgery, as well as postnatal surgery. If it has not already been performed by your referring perinatologist, an amniocentesis will be performed to be sure the fetal chromosomes are normal. In any event, you will meet with a genetic counselor to review your family's history for birth defects. In addition to the consultation, patients undergo extensive testing. A comprehensive ultrasound is performed to assess the presence of the Chiari 2 malformation and determine the level of the spina bifida defect. A fetal MRI will also be performed as some features of the spine and brain are better seen on MRI. 
MRI utilizes magnetic waves, which are safe during pregnancy. For mothers and babies who qualify for fetal surgery, additional consultations and evaluations are necessary. An obstetric anesthesiologist affiliated with the fetal center's multidisciplinary team will meet with the mother, assess any anesthetic risks, and explain any anesthesia concerns. A neonatologist who specializes in critically ill newborns will educate each family about the potential complications of a premature birth. Preterm delivery is a potential risk factor of fetal surgery. Families will meet with a social worker to discuss the importance of the family and friend support systems. Undergoing fetal surgery is a commitment through the entire pregnancy, which requires the help of others to ensure a safe pregnancy after fetal surgery. If there are other small children at home, a child life specialist at Children's Memorial Herman Hospital will meet with each family. This individual will provide valuable tools to help explain the unborn baby's surgery to the baby's siblings. Finally, families will meet with the fetal surgery specialist who will be involved in the surgery. The fetal center's affiliated team will go over the actual procedure and answer any questions you may still have. Fetal surgery is not for every patient. Often patients do not qualify because of reasons involving the fetus and sometimes they don't qualify because of maternal factors. There are also families who qualify for fetal surgery but do not think it is the best option for them after spending time learning about spina bifida and fetal surgery. For those who qualify for fetal surgery, we typically ask families to take a few days to consider all of the options they have been presented with. Undergoing fetal surgery for your baby is a major commitment and a lifestyle change for the remainder of the pregnancy and future pregnancies. It typically includes a five-day hospitalization following the fetal surgery, three weeks of strict bed rest after the procedure, and weekly ultrasounds to monitor the fetus and assess for complications of the surgery. More importantly, there may be prolonged subsequent hospitalizations during the pregnancy if complications should arise. Membrane separation, preterm labor, or leakage of amniotic fluid may require you to stay in the hospital for the remainder of your pregnancy. Should you elect to proceed with fetal intervention, your surgery will typically be scheduled before 26 weeks gestation. Fetal surgery for spina bifida is a complicated operation that requires the expertise of many physicians and surgeons. Two patients are undergoing an operation, the unborn baby with spina bifida and the pregnant mother. Care of the mother starts before entering the operating room. During the morning of surgery, the mother and baby undergo another full assessment, including a fetal ultrasound. An epidural for postoperative pain control is placed before surgery. Once inside the operating room, the mother and baby are again evaluated prior to the mother falling asleep with guided anesthesia. Meanwhile, the entire surgical team is preparing for the operation. Mothers undergoing fetal surgery are administered general anesthesia and an epidural for pain control. The skin incision is similar to an incision used for cesarean section deliveries. As the pregnant uterus is exposed, the well-being of the fetus and position of the placenta is again re-evaluated via ultrasound. The monitoring process is continued throughout the entire operation. In order to expose the back of the baby, the uterus is opened with an incision called a hysterotomy. The location of the incision is made to provide the best exposure of the spina bifida of the baby. Careful attention is made to avoid the placenta and large blood vessels within the uterine wall, as both are important for the baby's stability. A stapling device, especially designed for fetal surgery, is used to make the incision to prevent unnecessary bleeding. An opening in the uterus is made in an area away from the placenta, just large enough to expose the baby's back to see the spina bifida defect. Once the uterus is opened, only the area of the back with the spina bifida is exposed for the operation. The normal amniotic fluid is removed, and warm fluid is circulated into the uterus to replace it during the operation. This keeps the fetus warm and prevents kinking of the umbilical cord. Once the baby is properly positioned, pediatric neurosurgeons repair the defect in much the same way they would after birth. Once the spina bifida is repaired, the uterus is closed. Throughout the entire procedure, the baby and mother are continuously monitored by the surgical and anesthesia teams. The entire fetal surgery team works together to accomplish a very safe and efficient operation for both patients. While the fetal surgery team is working during the operation, the neonatology team is on standby, 
prepare to act quickly if the fetus demonstrates any signs of instability that would require immediate delivery. After surgery, you will be awakened from general anesthesia and go to recovery in your room in the labor and delivery unit, where you will receive one-on-one -on -one nursing care for the first two days. Both you and your baby are monitored during the remaining hospitalization. The first day after surgery is the most difficult. You will be asked to stay in bed and not allowed to drink or eat. Most patients have a hot and flushed sensation and often describe their feeling as losing a day. This is due to a medication called magnesium sulfate that helps prevent uterine contractions. As you continue to improve, this IV medication will be changed to an oral medication, which you will continue for the remainder of your pregnancy. You will be slowly encouraged to eat, drink, and get out of bed. Over the next few days, the epidural for pain control will be changed to oral medications as well. Typically, mothers stay at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital for five to seven days following surgery for recovery and evaluation, followed by a two-week stay in Houston for further monitoring. Often, patients choose to transfer their obstetrical care to an affiliated physician and deliver at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital. The team of coordinators at the fetal center works closely with families to make arrangements for their entire stay in Houston. If you choose to return to your local obstetrician for delivery, the team at the fetal center will work closely with the referring physician to ensure an open line of communication and coordinate your care throughout the remainder of your pregnancy. Several complications may occur after surgery and can occur during the hospitalization or thereafter. Upon discharge from the hospital, patients and their families are given very specific monitoring instructions to look for signs of problems. These include contractions, leaking of amniotic fluid, bleeding from the vagina, fevers, and separation of the amniotic membranes based on ultrasound. If you begin to experience uterine contractions, please contact the fetal center or your family physician immediately. Because only 20% of pregnancies reach term delivery after fetal surgery, mothers who have undergone surgery can go into labor at any time. Since the fetal membranes around the sac containing the baby were entered during the surgery, there is a significant risk of leaking amniotic fluid. Patients will usually experience fluid coming out of the vagina when they first stand up. This is a serious complication of the surgery, as it can lead to infection. If this occurs, seek immediate medical attention. If such leakage occurs, you will be likely in the hospital for the remainder of your pregnancy. Bleeding from the vagina may be a sign of abruption, a critical situation where the placenta is becoming dislodged from the uterine wall. Because this can have serious consequences, please contact the fetal center or your physician immediately. During weekly ultrasounds after discharge, the fetal membranes may become separated from the uterine wall. This is called chorioamnion separation. This condition puts you at high risk for leaking amniotic fluid. If membrane separation is detected by ultrasound, you will be admitted to the hospital for observation for the remainder of your pregnancy with potential for early delivery. In about 20% of cases in the MOMS trial, Patients experienced no complications and underwent a scheduled delivery by C-section at 37 weeks gestation. Even though this gestational age is three weeks earlier than the usual due date at 40 weeks gestation, your fetal surgery team feels that a delivery at 37 weeks is relatively safe for the baby, while minimizing the risks of spontaneous delivery. 37 weeks is also picked as a time for delivery to keep the fresh scar from your fetal surgery from stretching too much as the uterus gets bigger, and to prevent tearing with labor contractions. Because the heart and lungs are usually normal in babies with spina bifida, most infants are stable at delivery, but will receive their initial care in the neonatal intensive care unit. Although the MOMS trial was a well-designed clinical study, it only provides overall statistics for the benefits of fetal surgery compared to postnatal repair of spina bifida. It incorporated various types of patients with various severities of spina bifida, all of which have unique outcomes. Although many patients may medically qualify for fetal surgery, fetal surgery may not be the right choice for every mother and her family. Many factors go into this decision-making process, including maternal health and family well-being in addition to the overall health of the baby. Most parents ask about the outcome if they decide on fetal surgery. Although physicians do everything possible to minimize the risks of surgery, there is no way to predict the exact outcome.
The fetal center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital and the affiliated physicians at UT Health Medical School value the importance of patient education. Not every patient will require fetal surgery, but every family deserves to be thoroughly educated about their child's condition and the expected outcomes based on the specific findings of their child's condition, as well as a complete understanding of how this will affect their child's life and the family throughout their lifetime. The Fetal Center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital is a multidisciplinary clinical and research center whose affiliated physicians are faculty members at UT Health Medical School in Houston, Texas. The Fetal Center provides comprehensive maternal, fetal, and neonatal health care to pregnant women whose unborn babies have been diagnosed with a birth defect or a genetic condition. Located in the heart of the world-renowned Texas Medical Center, the Fetal Center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital includes affiliated fetal, pediatric, and adult specialists who provide a superior level of care for high-risk expectant mothers with complex disorders of the fetus. The Fetal Center and its affiliated physicians offer coordinated maternal, fetal, and neonatal care by providing a full spectrum of prenatal diagnostic evaluations, fetal surgery, and follow-up care. For all conditions, the Fetal Center works closely with patients to deliver the most comprehensive care for mothers and their babies. The Fetal Center's affiliated physician team aims to provide all families with a complete understanding of their child's condition and prognosis through prenatal counseling and educational materials. Patients are evaluated with advanced fetal imaging, including fetal MRI and fetal echocardiography, to provide the most accurate prenatal diagnosis. This educational video produced by the Fetal Center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital is designed to provide an overall understanding of spina bifida and available treatment options. It should be used in conjunction with personal evaluations and consultations with your doctor. Patients should not base decision-making solely on the information provided in the video. The physicians affiliated with the Fetal Center at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital provide medical services as members of UT Health and the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston.